G'day fans and welcome to the very first episode of Nerdy Things from Another World. Yes, just what the world needs, another podcast. But this one's a little bit different because it's actually been run by ourselves. And if you're wondering who ourselves happen to be, it's myself, good old Dags, and of course my co-host, Mr. Jeffro. How you going, man? Nano Nano. And for those people that didn't live through the 70s, you won't understand that at all. Very good stuff. So the key thing about this particular show is that we're going to be focusing not just on sci-fi movies and TV shows, which everybody else covers off, but we're going to be discussing Australian sci-fi fandom as well, because both Jeffro and I have been in the game, in the fan game for decades now. So just very quickly, old son, can you give us a bit of a rundown as to how cool you are because of your history? So I've been in uh, fandom for quite some time, actually, even before uh, Star Wars. I was uh, collecting things back in 1972 and 1973, thanks to uh, an interest in Jerry Anderson shows and Doctor Who. And um, I've sort of found myself cemented in the community ever since then. So uh, I'm glad to be on the show. Absolutely fantastic. And our plan, of course, is to produce a uh, first season of 10 episodes. So with a bit of luck, we might even give out a prize for anybody who gets through all 10 episodes. And I don't mean you or me, Jeffro, because uh, that's uh, that's kind of cheating. We might have a, a listener out there who goes, yep, I've listened to all 10 episodes. And of course, if that's the case, then we'll have to ask him a trivia question to make sure that they're not uh, pulling our chain, because uh, that wouldn't be good. So you can say, what happened at the 43rd minute mark of episode 6 of... <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just, I just want uh, it to be won by the Kurgan. Give me the prize. You know what I mean? Prize. Yes, because you are but a worm. Exactly right. Well, that's very, very, very cool. And with that in mind, even though it's our very, very first episode, we actually have a letter of comment, as I used to say in the old newsletter days, where someone's actually written in. How cool is this, Mister Jeffro? So, what do we got? It's amazing. They must have got in the DeLorean time machine and gone back to the future, and then sort of said, "Hey." really enjoyed those 10 episodes and little we realized we actually went for 11 but we thought it was going to be for 10 but uh how, how good is this that they've actually sent that letter back in time and we do have one that uh, reads dear nerds is it true that you used to edit science fiction magazines if so what were they and what did you find was the biggest challenge in producing them so a very good question uh, from uh, um michael j fox let's just say <laughs> <laughs> Where is that coming from? Um, and so the first, the answer to that question is yes, it is true. Uh, but it wasn't magazines so much; it was actually newsletters uh, for fan clubs. We both uh, edited them in different ways. So I'm going to start with you first. So, uh, what did you use to edit, and how? Or as the question asked, uh, the biggest challenge in producing them. So go for it. Well, um, I was very low tech, so low tech that actually um, when I was invited to do a Doctor Who newsletter because our uh, editor was um, not feeling that well and he needed someone else to do it, uh, my issue was sort of quite the uh, the embarrassment because uh, even at that early stage in the mid-late 80s, there was still software that would allow you to actually put in a, uh, a semi-decent uh, newsletter. But, of course, I didn't have access to that software. I had the good old typewriter and the good old glue stick and the good old scissors. And I literally, you know, put mine together sort of in the old fashioned way. And um, boy, uh, as I said, it uh, was looking retro and um, maybe not in a good way. So the uh, uh, the fans of Docky Who were very uh, happy to sort of see it go back to the, uh, uh, the more modern format uh, after my effort. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because a lot of people sort of forget that uh, with all the digital, uh, what they used to call desktop publishing software, uh, which as you, that's what you're referring to, prior to that existing, everything was on paper and it was done using very, very primitive technology. And I actually remember I had an electric typewriter that you borrowed off me. Uh, and I don't know if you remember this or not, but you would just type out all the material that you had to just write and then get the scissors out and just cut it and paste it and stick it on a sheet of paper, which then went through the photocopier. And even though uh, in its raw format, I swear you couldn't even bend the page because of the amount of glue and sticky tape, when it came out at the photocopier's end, it actually looked really good. And there were occasions where I looked at some of your work and go, that is actually very, very schmick because that was all we had at the time. And that meant that also that producing newsletters was a long and laborious process because it took ages to just get this stuff done. Um, so you would have fixed Do you remember that at all when uh, you did that? I with my I I really do. And I mean, it was, um, I was so grateful that you actually had a lot better um, typewriter than I did. So, you know, what can I say? I infused it with personality. So 
whilst I didn't have the uh, professionalism of the, uh, uh, I said, the desktop software, uh, I gave it the personality that I thought made it interesting. And, of course, the interesting question would be to ask that, you know, if you look at an old school 1980s newsletter versus a modern day publication, sure, by, you know, every stretch, the modern day one just looks fantastic. But you do wonder if the content would necessarily be any better because back in our day before the internet, um, when you got newsletters for fan clubs, it was like your only link to not only other members, but also to what was going on in the franchise that you're following. Because the theory was that if you're running a, a fan club, you had access to all this latest news and gossip and uh, information. And it was like people used to hang out for newsletters to turn up, regardless of how they used to look. Thing is, with the news, I remember when I was doing a, a Buckaroo Bonsai fanzine, I had access to the uh, international fan club's newsletters. So it was like, Let's pilfer all the information I need out of that so I can then put together something really cool. So um, obviously you can't do that these days because, you know, everyone's got access to the information straight away all around the world. But, uh, you know, putting together something locally using stuff that I could access internationally did give me a, a boost. Which is interesting because they were called newsletters because they provided news. But, of course, these days, as you just said, you don't need a newsletter to get news. Uh, so, if anything, the news is almost like secondary now because uh, the biggest issue you have with the newsletter now that if you put news in it, by the time it comes out, uh, it's already out of date. So, it's any, if anything, you've got to fill it up full of uh, all this other information. So, funnily enough, for modern-day editors, their biggest challenge would be working at what to put in them, whereas back in our day, People used to write and contribute material all the time, articles and pictures and whatever else. And as an editor, it was actually a bit of a big job to try and sort out what you were going to include and what wouldn't go in. And you would have, would have experienced this yourself, yeah? So from just a, a plethora of material coming through that you had to try and sort of wade your way through? I mean, it was sort of a badge of honour to actually get yourself in print. So, uh, you know, you'd often get people contributing because... Uh, not only was, the, if you're watching a show that it might have been on at the time, like Next Generation, you know, you could sort of make fresh comments, but also a lot of social activities as well. So people often would write sort of a uh, an article about, say, the, the banquet or the convention that would, had just gone on. So they were able to sort of give you uh, fresh content because there was a lot going on in fandom at the time. And I guess not so much now. We, uh, we don't really sort of see enough newsworthy content. Actually, that's a good point. An event would occur and then you'd have people who could not write a review of it fast enough, send it off to the respective fan club, get it put into the newsletter. And for people who didn't go to the event, it was the next best thing of saying, well, I wasn't there. What happened? And if you had four or five articles written by people who said, oh, yes, I was at this gig. This is what it was like. You almost got a picture of it in your mind. And of course, that just you're right. That doesn't happen at all now. So, um, so I guess... From a, uh, the biggest challenge in producing newsletters, the, the content part wasn't the hard part. That was actually probably the easy bit. You probably had too much information sometimes. Um, if anything, it was the physical creation of them, as we said earlier. So, you know, you had to use typewriters and sticky tape things together. And I actually knew of uh, a fan club that uh, when they were doing fanzines, now a fanzine is different to a newsletter where they, uh, a newsletter is part of your membership to a club. So you get that by default, but a fanzine is something over and above that, an additional publication that you pay money for, which included stories and artwork by fans. And this particular um, fanzine, they uh, had, a, had a typewriter devoted to it. And of course, every story that came in, the editor would have to retype word for word every single story just to keep the fonts looking the same the whole way through. That's just beyond madness when you sit and think about it. But the end result, it was actually really, really cool. So uh, so it is interesting to sort of see what the biggest issue was. And, of course, there was also another thing that came with newsletters back in the day too, which you may have uh, sort of forgotten about and certainly doesn't occur here anymore, is the collation days. So I was just, I was actually just thinking of that, the extra long stapler and you'd lay out all the different pages and you'd go around a table in a circle and take one off each stack until you finally had the, uh, the whole thing uh, put together. Yep, that's right. So what would happen is you'd go to the, you'd get your stuff done by the printers. Hopefully you actually had a proper printer and not someone's uh, work using a, a photocopier. You get all the pages individually. Usually they're all A4 and you'd lay them out all around a table and you just organise a collation day and all these people would turn up and just systematically hour after hour <laughs> just walk around, as you said, have to collect all the pages. Somebody would staple them. Someone would then have to uh, fold them up and sticky tape them together, put the label on them. And 
it was a big job, but I'll tell you what, it was a good social outing too, for, or not an outing, but a social get-together for a lot of people as well, the collation days. Some were better than others, some were bigger than others, some were longer than others, but uh, in the end it had to be done and there was always no shortage of volunteers prepared to give up their time for it. And and some fold better than others, and I definitely know I was not in that uh, category. So, you know, there was some issues that were not quite sort of straight when I folded them. So, you know, I tended to sort of just do the collating and let the uh, experts uh, do the folding and uh, stapling. Yeah, it was funny because one of the clubs that I was involved with, they were trying to avoid the folding because, it, you know, they were some letterboxes they, they used to get jammed into because some of the issues were so thick that they just didn't fit through the slot in the letterbox. So they come up with the idea of trying to use plastic bags. So they put the newsletter in a plastic bag so it wouldn't get folded at all, you know, with the old do not bend on the outside effectively. And depending on how they were delivered, they would actually arrive at a person's house in pretty good nick. And you could take them out of the bag and go, oh, that's really, really groovy. But, of course, that was an extra overhead in terms of purchasing the bags putting them in the bags, and I don't know if you got charged extra for the bags. So you sort of solve one problem, but uh, in effect just create another. But it was an interesting time. And, of course, for myself, um, what was interesting is that uh, I instigated uh, for one of the newsletters I edited, uh, moving from paper to digital. So back in 2013 when I was in uh, doing the editorship for a, the Star Walking Inc., the Star Wars uh, fan club, um, I really wanted to push away from paper, so I actually transferred everything over to digital. I, I don't know if I was the first to do it, whether it be in Australia, the world, whatever, I don't know, for a sci-fi fan club, but uh, I actually produced uh, digital newsletters. And um, the challenges in them actually just plummeted because I had didn't have to worry about printing, I didn't have to worry about colour because everything was in colour, the length of the issues, because that was another thing that it usually used to have because they went to a printer, they had to have a certain amount of pages, especially if you're doing A3 folded, so you couldn't just like to do 15 pages because you'd end up with blank sheets so that was the thing that uh, i instigated and pushed for and ironically the the challenge that i had is as we discussed earlier no content because news wasn't worth putting out because everybody was doing news and as we discussed people weren't writing articles anymore and contributing um reviews of events so i pretty much had to write the thing myself which i didn't mind but i thought it really wasn't as ideal as I would have preferred, and that was the downside to being the editor at that time. So, uh, so you win in one area and you sort of lose in another. That was that was always the um, the editor's lament is just making sure that you had enough uh, contributions to uh, to get you through. I remember there was some times in the uh, the good old days where we actually had more than what we need, mm. but you know that was that was very rare. And I was just thinking too that uh, back in the day you read your newsletter either sort of uh, on the public transport or you know sort of at the office and all that but you know these days everything's read on a phone so why would you actually print something off when most people don't bother to actually hold it in their hands they just want to sort of see it on their uh, phone which is true and of course the downside to that is they get lost in the midst of time buried on hard drive somewhere and when there's like no physical copies anywhere, uh, it's hard to sort of empty the garage and come across a newsletter from 15, 20 years ago and go, oh my God, no, I haven't seen this for so long and read through them all. Now that's just all going to go. So once a newsletter's been uh, produced and um, so emailed to somebody, they'll pretty much become a dead entity the moment the person's looked through them and they're finished. And uh, I guess that's the downside to it. So uh, so there you go. So uh, it's, it is interesting. So yes, we did actually edit newsletters, both Jeffro and myself. Um, and uh, the challenges that we face are completely different to, to the challenges that uh, newsletter ed editors have today. But uh, at least they're still being produced out there somewhere. So if you are, are a member of a fan club, which in itself is a bit of a challenge these days, uh, be sure to submit some articles and things to your local editor. They will love you for it. Um, any further words before we move on, Mr. Jeff Rowe? Yeah, I'd like to thank Michael J. Fox for his valuable uh, question, and we hope to hear from him uh, sometime in the future. Yeah, and with that in mind, if you actually do want to send us a question that you want us to address, uh, you can do so. So uh, just go to the Sci-Fi Zone page and send us a message. Just write down uh, just like the Attention to the Nerdy Things pod podcast, otherwise we won't know what, what it's for. And uh, we will actually address it and review it and uh, talk about it here, and it should be very, very groovy. So uh, good stuff. But now we've got to move on to our main topic. This one's a little bit of a controversial one to a large degree. Mr. Jeffro, what is uh, the topic for our nattering for this? This evening well we have a situation where we've got two big franchise giants star wars and star trek and we need to sort of work out who we believe is making the better content at the moment so this will be our discussion for tonight 
So this is primarily television shows, yes? Oh, yes, because we've got all the content that uh, Disney's pumping out. And we also have, of course, uh, Paramount uh, doing their share of Star Trek television shows. So it's interesting when uh, you sort of bring that up because uh, there's two primary media formats that are occurring at the moment. You've got the animated shows that uh, both franchises are producing and the live action shows, which uh, sort of have their own sort of ups and downs at the moment. As someone said to me not that long ago, it seems to me that whenever one franchise is going up, the other one's sort of struggling. So if Star Trek is having some really, really bad shows, Star Wars is doing really, really well. As an example of that, we had uh, Discovery, which wasn't, well received by Star Trek fans, but at the same time, Mandalorian was just kicking all these goals for Star Wars. And then you wind the clock around and all of a sudden now, the book of Boba Fett wasn't a very well received series for Star Wars fans. But then you've got Strange New Worlds, which has come out and is kicking a lot of goals. So it's checks and balances for both sides. So it is an interesting one. I think it's a question of as to what time of the year you're looking at this, but uh, there are good and bad examples um, on both camps. So uh, to start with, animated and live action, what sort of floats your boat on both counts? Well, I mean, when we started off with Star Wars, we started off very strongly with um, the um, uh, the Clone Wars uh, episode so well that, I mean, it ran for, what, about five, six seasons. So that was that was set the par because the, uh, the stories were very clever it introduced a lot of fascinating characters that have since gone on and done other things in uh, live action. And um, we also saw, uh, uh, said, uh, a resurgence of uh, Star Wars fandom because people were really getting into uh, to Clone Wars. And uh, and it was almost like a, uh, a sad thing when it finally ended. So um, that started off very strongly, whereas uh, Star Trek, I mean, they've never really understood uh, the animated side of things or... Uh, they did give it a try, and we saw some good examples, but uh, certainly uh, from the animated side, uh, you can't beat uh, Star Wars at the moment. So you're talking purely from the animation style, like 2D versus 3D, or the stories in particular? I mean, it's always come down to the stories. I mean, we have seen uh, Star Wars let down a little bit in terms of the animation style. So I remember seeing uh, Resistance, and I thought, well, I could have done that on MS Paint. It sort of looked that bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, and with, um, with, with Star Trek, I think they've uh, at least always put enough money into the, uh, the, the animated uh, stories that the quality does look good. But uh, with... Um, the Star Wars ones, it's been a little bit of a mixed bag. I mean, we sort of saw uh, an improvement with uh, Bad Batch and um, the Visions uh, series certainly is quite unique in terms of their um, uh, style. So uh, all up, I mean, apart from Resistance, I think everything else has been quite good animated-wise. So how would you uh, rate good old, uh, from the Star Trek side, Lower Decks and Prodigy? I've not watched either, but I know Lower Decks has a massive fan following for it. Well, lower lower decks is interesting because they don't tend to take themselves seriously, which is really weird because uh, it's almost making a, a, a mockery of uh, the existing tropes. So that's been quite unique to sort of see them go down that path. It was a very brave move. I mean, a lot of fans were quite resistant to it because they don't like to see their side of the uh, the franchise sort of being, um, I said, uh made fun of but i think it's won a lot of people over with the, sort of the comic honesty that uh, they're putting out and, and the characters have, have been fun to uh, to watch you sort of you, you get to sort of know them and um, you sort of take them in when you uh, uh, watch a sort of quite a few episodes and sort of get suckered into it you are right lower decks is a very light-hearted i assume it's like almost a gpg sort of program which caters uh, for the fan base uh, really, really well, and now a lot of people are really dialed into it. Whereas all the Star Wars ones are relatively serious, um, so there's no real comedy in them. They're just, uh, or unless it's situation comedy, but they're all part of the large continuity and the large storyline. And you do wonder if they were to do, if you were to swap it around, for example, and do a lower decks version in a Star Wars universe, would it work, or would it just alienate people because they would just find it uh, annoying? Or whether if Star Trek does a really serious show in animation you do wonder how that would come uh, come about but anyway for as it is we have what we have and um i tend to agree with you i think uh, some of the star wars stuff is quite good for a lot of the fan base and of course a lot of things have changed since the disney takeover back in 2012 
the funny thing about the animated series for Star Wars is not all fans watch them. And uh, there are a lot of fans out there who just go, you know what, it's the old, you know, inverted commas cartoon shows, so they just stay away, even though they're still part of the actual, of the overall canon. And, of course, as you mentioned, a lot of characters are now being brought into live action from those series, and a lot of people are very confused as to who these people are. And you go, well, if you had to watch the animated shows, you'd know that. Um, whereas in the Star Trek side, it's not as important. So uh, I know a lot of people who do watch Lower Decks really enjoy it, and I'm not really sure what Prodigy is, um, but there's enough live action material going around that uh, I think you can sort of survive not actually watching the animated shows. Funnily enough, uh, the one of the episodes of Strange New Worlds actually featured um, the Lower Decks characters, which was uh, a bit of a massive success for the fans, and uh, it was kind of good to see. It's it's almost like uh, when we saw the uh, characters out of Rebels uh, turn into um, live action characters for uh, Ahsoka. It's like sort of seeing that uh, transition from cartoon to uh, live action is quite fascinating. Well, that's exactly right. And be curious to see where it's all going because at the moment, I think from the Star Wars side, uh, the animation studios are all shutting down. So that could be the end of that side of things, even though uh, Bad Batch, I think, was meant to have another season. And I'm not too sure what the future of that will be. With Star Trek, they're clearly ploughing along quite happily as they are. So uh, all power to them. From the live action side, uh, it's interesting to sort of see who's got what, where, and how it's all progressing. So in the past, say, six or seven years, Star Wars have been uh, pummeling out all these different shows and for the most part have been quite successful in various guises. And uh, Star Trek has been doing exactly the same thing. So uh, it's sort of an interesting sort of way to look at it to go, well, which has sort of worked? Like Mandalorian was the flagship show for... uh, uh, for Star Wars, and up until recently, you'd say the Strange New Worlds is now the flagship show for Star Trek, even though it was meant to have been Discovery. And of course, Discovery really hit a massive roadblock uh, in a big way. Uh, it just alienated a massive amount of the fan base because it was just so different. And if anything, you wouldn't call it really a hump in the road; it was more like a massive pothole. And since the show's kind of finished after its fourth season, which I don't think it was planned. I suspect that in time it will be completely forgotten. Picard, on the other hand, is sort of slots in there somewhere. There was a lot of promise for it. I remember when the trailers were coming out all those years ago, it was going to be the great big thing, you know, next generation sort of like continuation. And it's had its ups and downs. First season was good. Second season kind of was a bit jerky, a little bit like the place. Third season, they just chucked in everything, brought all of the next generation um, cast back, and it was a massive winner. And you do have to wonder that if the Picard season three was actually season one, it would probably be one of the greatest Star Trek shows of all time, but uh, wasn't necessarily the case. So, so how'd you find all this? There was a lot to get through, um, but uh, so what's what were the standards for you? I, I actually find that uh, Star Trek f- fans are very grateful for what they receive. So, you know, if they get a, a new series of anything, it's like, oh, this is fantastic because they've gone through some uh, dark times. I mean, let's let's face it. So, classic trek and then next gen it was such a long period and then of course after that the movies and then we saw nothing until sort of recent times so they're very grateful for what they get whereas i think with the star wars fans it's like sort of okay well if you're going to give me something bring it on and and make it good so i think they're a lot more demanding but uh, i've really been enjoying um uh, the, the star trek uh, series even discovery so uh, i i take it for what it is and i i sort of uh, Uh, I think I've enjoyed every single Star Trek series, whereas Star Wars, you know, we come down to things like um, Kenobi, where I didn't enjoy it so much, uh, and also uh, Book of Boba Fett, which we mentioned before. uh, And I can't really sort of put a finger on why I didn't enjoy them much, other than the fact that uh, the characters didn't invest as much with me as uh, Star Trek and uh, just something about the uh, the writing. It's also uh, serious and uniform. Yeah, it's an interesting point about how Star Trek fans are a little bit more devoted to their franchise um, and are prepared to sort of take things on board with Discovery. As I said, it did alienate a lot of people and I think people just sort of walked away from it and said, you know, it's not my show, I'll just leave it at that. And that was primarily because of the large amount of swearing and the really excessive violence for those people who did dial into it. And I was one of them. Um, I actually thought its first and second seasons were actually uh, really quite good, but I can see why it didn't work for everybody. And then ironically, uh, Strange New Worlds is a spin-off from Discovery and look where that's gone because it's uh, following the same format as the original series. 
and it's been doing very well for itself, which is really, really good to see. And you are correct. You know, Star Wars fans tend to be unbelievably critical of the shows that are being produced for them. And it's it's kind of sad to hear that, but it's completely true. And I do think a lot of that really does have to stem back to the anti-Disney sentiment that's been going around since 2012. And, you know, with the sequel trilogy not sort of working for everybody and whatever else. And, and some fans are taking it a bit too seriously, a bit too much to heart. And in the end, it comes down to that old adage, if there's a show on and you don't like it, just don't watch it, just move on. It's just a TV show, dude. you just got to just chill with it. <laughs> it's not the end of the earth. And Unbelievable. The uh, interesting thing is a Star Wars fan can write a bad review about a television show even before it's aired. You know, that's like they've already got their mindset sometimes. It's like sort of, uh, uh, this is not going to work, so uh, I'm, I'm going to trash it before it even gets officially on which is kind of funny because uh because you and i have been in the fan thing for such a long period of time that uh back in the day uh it really was the cultural divide between the communities so you had star wars on one side and star trek on the other and never the twain shall meet because there was a period especially back in the 1990s star trek was just like the greatest franchise on the planet then of course the new star wars movies come into play and uh everybody was sort of like you go the star trek fans on the left hand side of the room and star wars fans on the right these days it's actually common to see them all mixed up so you'll have people who watch both sets of shows uh and of course the funny thing is you know star trek is heading towards what 60 years and star wars heading towards 50 years and they're still producing new material and at the very least that needs to be applauded uh rather than sitting there just banging the shit out of this stuff going oh my god i can't handle this i can't handle that it's like oh geez guys take a chill pill but um it's good it's good to see and so i guess you can ask the question as to which of the two franchises is producing the best tv shows and i guess because they've both have it had hits and misses there's not one that just stands out as being like they've got the whole um the the formula down pat the other interesting thing i uh just came across was that with star trek they're more likely to invest in several different uh seasons whereas star wars it's like they only really do a limited run uh and there's other than the mandalorian which has done you know several seasons all the other examples are sort of really just, you know, single runs for one season. And, I mean, that might work well for some, but, you know, if you've got a, a, a taste for certain characters and you want them to continue on, then other than Mandalorian, you're going to be very disappointed. Yeah, and I think the reason why Mandalorian was such a successful was because of Grogu. Um, there are, it catered to the public because of that one character. And even my other half, Lynn, she was watching the pilot episode of Mandalorian and was just completely tuned out of it until Grogu appeared at the end and just fell in love with the show. And it was an ingenious concept. It really was. And as I said to people, they could have made Grogu look like a horse's ass, but they didn't. He made him look cute and cuddly. And for that reason, I think that gave the show a lot of longevity. Although it's very interesting because, you know, we mentioned earlier how the book of Boba Fett was a disappointment. And I actually said to a lot of people that what I think would have worked much better is if you take the character of Din Djarin from The Mandalorian, take him out and just replace him with Boba Fett and keep everything identical, it would have been like the greatest TV show on the entire planet. Somewhere along the way, you can explain how he got out of the Sarlacc. That doesn't matter, but he always leaves the helmet on. He's, he's the cool, hard-ass, anti-hero character. So, But he's not Din Djarin. He's Boba Fett. And, I reckon, and he's the one who has to look after Grogu. I reckon that would have been fantastic. But it wasn't to be. And uh, there is certainly an argument to say, do some of these shows work better as movies? Now, ironically, Obi-Wan Kenobi, some fan got it and cut it down to a two-and-a-half-hour film. I haven't seen it, but apparently it's quite good because there was a lot of stuff in that series that kind of didn't work, didn't gel. And I think if Disney were to look at this again, maybe they can say, yeah, you know what? We don't have to make theatrical release movies, but just make the shows as a film might be the option but of course if you're trying to get subscribers to disney plus you're going to do them week to week even if it's not necessary to do so so that that was my understanding is that kenobi was originally slated to be a uh, movie but thanks to the uh, uh the lack of success that solo provided then uh, uh that was actually all canned so apparently they did sort of recycle that original movie script and make uh, the kenobi series out of that uh, and, and somewhere, I believe there was also a Boba Fett uh, movie, yeah, but yeah, how much of that was incorporated into the, the book of Boba Fett, I don't know. But certainly the Kenobi one, I think, was um, the same script, just uh, reformatted. 
Yep, that's a fair point. It's interesting. We were talking about Discovery earlier, how I was saying how it alienated a lot of Star Trek fans because it was just so different, right? There was everything looked different. The characters looked different. The ship looked different. The concepts were different. There was swearing and violence and whatever else. On the Star Wars side, that, of course, occurred with Andor. So Andor was the Cassian Andor character from Rogue One. Uh, it was noted in the show that he had a bit of a hard upbringing and uh, had done things for the Rebel Alliance he wasn't proud of. And Andor really doesn't fit in with the flow of all the other shows around it. It is definitely, um, well, I wouldn't say R-rated, but it's definitely uh, mature only. It's not designed for children. It is actually quite slow. Uh, it's very methodical. The quality is outstanding. But I knew a lot of Star Wars fans who said, you know what, I can't get into it because it's just so different. It is so not the galaxy far, far away as we know it. And yet uh, those who've really gotten through it have applauded it for being so different. And it's very adult in a lot of ways, and that they do things in that series they've never done in any other shows. So, whether that's a formula for the future is anybody's guess. Uh, but I think if you're a Disney executive, you'd be going, Well, we need to cater for the biggest possible margin of audience we can, which includes adults and kids. And Andor, as I said, was not for kids. So, hence the reason why uh, I think um, future shows will probably, as a guess, will be a little bit more tamer. Um, I think P Paramount have had their, ch their, their um, experiment with the Discovery, found it didn't work. And as a result, Strange New Worlds is the one that's kicking all the goals now. And uh, it's only just finished its second season and it finished on a massive high. And I do know for a fact that there were people who were saying, oh, wow, Strange New Worlds is definitely the show to watch compared to, say, what was going on with uh, Star Wars. Star Wars couldn't compete at all. So um, with that show, you'd like to sort of wish it all the best and see where it all goes. The only thing that can bring them undone, of course, it is set before the original series, providing they don't balls up their own continuity and add in things. You go, hang on, you can't do that because those characters haven't been introduced yet. They don't appear until the original series of this or next generation of that. So, But other than that, it's uh, doing very well. Actually, the other thing I was just thinking of is that with Star Trek, the seasons tend to end on a cliffhanger, whereas you don't get that in, in the Star Wars television show. So the fact that it ends with a cliffhanger really does make you sort of invest in one of seeing a, another series of it. So I think sort of that's a clever um, bit of marketing from the, uh, the people at Paramount. Well, that's exactly right. And as it is, uh, so for the future, so, so for people out there who don't know what's happening, so from a TV show perspective, uh, from Star Wars, there's a fair bit coming out, actually. So you've still got the show Acolyte, which has been filmed, but is due for release next year. Another series that appeared out of absolute nowhere was called Skeleton Crew. I don't know anything about that. Something to do with kids, I think. Uh, they mentioned a Lando series a while ago, and I think there's a, even a couple more, which are probably still in the, in the dark depths to be produced. Uh, and from what ironically is going to happen is that a lot of the stuff that's occurring with the Man uh, Mandalorian, Ahsoka, uh, which are all set in the same time frame, their storylines are going to be wrapped up in a film produced by Dave Filoni in a couple of years' time. So that'll be where all that finishes up. On the Star Trek side, uh, the TV series, the only one we know of that we think is getting produced is Section 31, which was uh, had been introduced a long time ago and, oh, I can't even remember what I mean, DS, Deep Space Nine, but got really highlighted in Discovery with uh, Michelle Yeoh. I believe she's coming back for that, assuming it all gets to go ahead. And I don't know of any Star Trek movies uh, in, the, uh, in the foreseeable future, but the good news is both franchises are still playing on with new material. So um, as I say in the classics, watch this space. I, the one I want to see is the, uh, uh, the Adventures of Baby Yoda. So basically go back to the Baby Yoda name because, I mean, that was, that was what people loved and, and bought the, the merchandise on is that Baby Yoda name. So as soon as it became Grogu, I mean, the, the interest died down. I mean, you, you have to sort of admit that. Here's a known fact for people out there who didn't know this. When they first created the puppet, uh, Bob Iger, who was the president of Disney, we're talking about the biggest cheese of cheeses, he was calling it Baby Yoda. And he actually got told off by Lucasfilm in an email saying, don't do that because actually it's a misrepresentation of the character. It's either the asset, the child, the puppet, the, the prop. Every, you can call it anything you want, but don't call it Baby Yoda because that's actually uh, making people think it is actually Yoda reborn or a, a child of Yoda. And, of course, it wasn't. It just happens to be the same species. So even the president of Disney got his ass kicked over that one. But I do agree, calling him Grogu was a shit name. That was that was bloody awful. And it's funny, they mentioned in the show, uh, Pelimoto actually says, that's a terrible name. It's like, yes, we've been saying that since it's been first mentioned and i can tell you even though they said don't use the name i bet they copyright it so no one else could use it yeah that's a good point and of course the name has definitely stuck over this period of time so and the cool thing is there's a lot of stuff coming out for both franchises if you're like jeff and myself you just watch everything yeah some things you'll enjoy more than others but the good thing is it's all out there they're going places 
and it is really, really good to see. And no doubt once the writers and actor strikes are all over, they'll be pumping stuff out left, right and centre, which is absolutely fantastic. And with that in mind, it's actually time for us to sort of uh, call it a day. So, um, uh, yeah, we've got a lot of stuff going on. Hopefully our next uh, nine episodes will uh, attract millions upon millions of listeners and throbbing viewers. Hey, uh, Michael, you- J- Michael J. Fox said there was going to be 11 uh, well, there you go. Uh, we're going Spinal Tap 11. Absolutely love it. There you go. Uh, Mr. Jeffro, have you got any final words before we sign off for this evening? Yeah, as a, a blend of uh, the two different shows, I'd like to say live long and may the force be with you. Yeah, absolutely fantastic. Or as someone suggested, it was actually you who suggested this for a T-shirt design, Star Wars fans hating Star Wars since 1999. <laughs> I love it. Absolutely fantastic. All right, we're going to buzz our fans. Uh, leave you to a party hard rock on and uh, make sure whatever you do, aside from supporting good old sci-fi zone where this show is hosted, make sure you <gasps> stay nerdy. Okay, see you later. Ta-da. Bye.